we're talking with Rob Knight. Rob is a professor in chemistry and biochemistry and also in computer sciences at the University of Colorado. Rob, you're one of the gurus of the microbiome project. And we've learned so many new and different exciting things from that project. What are some of the real key surprises? Well, I think one of the key surprises is how different we are from one another microbially. So uh, as, as you know, we're all essentially the same in terms of our human genome, 99.9 .9 plus percent identical. Whereas uh, in terms of the microbes that we carry on our hands, uh, in our guts, um, and uh, on and inside different, different parts of our body, we're often 80 or 90 percent different. So it's just fascinating how much variation there is. And then one of the key questions is, does all that variation matter? Or uh, does all that variation not matter? Is it different because it actually makes a difference to health? Or is it different because it can just vary randomly? Another fascinating thing is that there does not seem to be a core of microbes that we all share, uh, but rather uh, any microbe that you find as being abundant in one person, uh, you'll find some other person who, who completely lacks it, or at least has it at such a low level that we can't detect it with the techniques that we usually use. So, um, so, so again, it doesn't seem like we're all colonized uh, in the gut, at least, with the same stuff. You see very different species assemblages in, in different people. The third thing that I think is fascinating is, is the links that are starting to come up between microbes in the gut and the brain. So there's been some very interesting research recently on, uh, on, on probiotics and anxiety in mice. Uh, there was also, uh, also some work we did with Andrew Gewitz's group a couple of years ago, looking at how, uh, how you can have a genetic mutation in the mouse that triggers a change in the microbial community that makes that mouse obese. But the way it does it isn't by making it more efficient at metabolizing, uh, metabolizing what it's eating. What it does instead is it makes the mouse hungrier, right? So it becomes obese because it eats more. And uh, you can cure it, uh, you know, you can cure it with antibiotics. Um, you can also take those microbes and stick them in a completely genetically normal mouse with no microbes of its own. And that, and, and that other mouse, uh, that other mouse will also uh, eat more and will also become obese. So, um, and, and uh, you know, that's, uh, and, and that's completely a behavioral thing. So uh, I think one thing that's fascinating is just all, all of these connections where microbes may be doing things that we never suspected. Yeah, there's more of them on us than human cells and they do more things than we could have ever imagined. Uh, um, so one of, the, one of the kind of grand goals that was often spoken of with the Microbiome Project is that in fact we would be able to develop probiotics that would uh, influence a lot of these different aspects. But when we're so different, it, is that a realistic concept? Well, that, that's a great question. So, uh, so there are some, so there are some kinds of therapies that have been extraordinarily effective, like uh, like stool transplants, for example, where you have people with Clostridium difficile uh, that, that's so severe that that it's resisted antibiotic therapies even for a couple of years, and yet the cure rate, uh, just taking a stool sample, uh, making a smoothie out of it, or uh, or, or going in the other route as well, uh, sometimes. Um, and, and then transplanting a normal microbiota has been enormously successful, so 90 to 95 percent cure rates. So there are some kinds of things where, uh, where it seems like these ecosystem level therapies are extremely plausible and extremely robust. So, so there's three things that we need to know in order to, uh, in, in order to um, do therapies based on the microbiome, right? We need to know what a good community looks like. Uh, we need to know what a bad community looks like. And we, know, we need to know how to get from the bad community to the good community. And until recently, we haven't known any of those things. And now we know one of them, right? We, we, we know what a good community looks like. And so uh, being able to figure out not just what the, what the bad community looks like, but also how to get to the right place from there, I think is going to be really critical. So you're from New Zealand, and, uh -huh. and New Zealand was one of the places that was so plagued by invasive species where somebody said, I'm going to bring this species in because it's going to do something good for the environment, and in the end it was horrible, right? And the, the worry with modulating the microbial flora is that in fact maybe we don't know enough to be able to avoid those kinds of problems. It's something I worry about a lot, and uh, developing the kind of uh, you know developing the kind of sound ecological theory that allows us to predict what will happen when you introduce a microbe into a particular environment. Um, I, I think we have a much better chance of doing that with microbes than was ever the case for microorganisms, because uh, you know they're so small that you can get uh, you, you can do you can do enough replicate experiments to really figure out if you can predict what will happen when you introduce a, a particular microbial um, member into a community. So one of the 
sayings people use commonly is you, you can't see the forest for the trees. One of the problems when you have complex systems like this is sometimes you can't see the trees for the forest. So, so if you make estimates, how much of the diversity are we missing out there? When you, for example, use 16S ribosome RNA as a mechanism to try to identify who's out there. Right, well, well so as, as you know, there's this thing called the Great Plate Count Anomaly, which basically says that of the things you can see under a microscope, only about 1% of them will actually grow when you try to culture them. And that's often confused with another number, which is what, what fraction of the kinds of species um, that you see, or rather a fraction of the kinds of sequences that, that you see with 16S sequencing, um, will you be able to uh, grow in a lab when you culture from the same environment. So for, for some environments, we're getting really good at doing the culturing, so, um, so in the gut, for example, uh, the discovery that a lot of, of gut microbes were microaerophiles rather than being strictly anaerobic or strictly aerophilic um, turned out to be really important for getting a lot more to grow in culture. And so, uh, and, and so the human gut, uh, at least the um, at least at least the gut of healthy uh, young adults, um, that that's getting pretty well tapped out. And so when we uh, when we sequence a lot more, we're not finding a lot of new stuff there. Whereas this other environments, like for example, uh, coal beds and uh, other hydrocarbon contaminated environments, where uh, you do the sequencing there and you find uh, you find a whole lot of new diversity that's not even closely related to anything in the database. In the Earth Microbiome Project, uh, when we when we map against green genes, which is this amazing phylogenetic resource uh, compiling uh, compiling 16S from uh, the database of different environmental projects, um, at the 97% identity level, which is often used to uh, as a rough approximation for species. Um, we have already covered 82% of all of the species level OTUs that have uh, ever been previously observed in the environment. So, uh, so in the EMP we're already doing pretty well, but uh, in contrast only about 17% of the tree is covered by things on the human body. Well, so that, the idea that globally these are major problems, I think it ties in very well to a project that you've just been doing with Bangladesh. Could you tell us about that? Yes, absolutely. So one, one thing that's very exciting in, uh, in the microbiome field at the moment is cloud computing. And the reason why it's so exciting is that a lot of the data sets that we're dealing with now, uh, you, you're going to have millions or hundreds of millions of sequences. And if you, try to, if you try to interpret those sequences on your laptop, you'll be waiting an awfully long time, right? So, uh, so, so the problem is that many labs, and uh, this, uh, this is not just here in Bangladesh, but uh, you know, uh, most labs in the building where I work don't have their, uh, don't have their own compute clusters because uh, you need special cooling, uh, you need a systems administrator to run them and all that kind of thing. So, so the amazing thing with cloud computing is that there's a number of, uh, there's a number of different vendors like Amazon, for example, where uh, basically what you do is you just, uh, you know, you just um, give Amazon your credit card number. Uh, frankly, I'm guessing they have your credit card number already, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and you tell them, I'd like this many CPUs and I'd like it to run for this long. And uh, you can create yourself this, this instant computer somewhere in some data center. You don't even have to know where it is, but has thousands of CPUs and has, uh, has, has thousands of gigabytes of RAM. And so, so what we were doing in Bangladesh, uh, the, this is part of the Skates Foundation project looking at microbes and malnutrition. And, uh, and, and so ICDDRB, which is one of the world's leading uh, cholera research sites, uh, they, they have produced a lot, of, uh, a lot of the samples in that project. So, um, but the problem is that, uh, and th this is common to many projects carried out uh, in, in developing countries, um, they collect the samples, uh, they do the DNA extraction on site, but then the DNA gets sent to the United States for analysis. And then, uh, you know, many years later, uh, when an academic paper is written about it, then the information gets back to them. And, uh, and, and so, so by that point, it's no longer clinically relevant to the child they were treating. And so one, one thing we're trying to do is we're trying to dramatically shorten that time between when the sample is collected and when the results can be interpreted and analyzed. So we had a whole classroom full of 22 Bangladeshi researchers and students all logged into Amazon Web Services, uh, creating, uh, creating these instant supercomputers that they could use to analyze the data that had been collected at their site and to look at the trajectory of how the microbiome had developed in over 100, uh, over 100 Bangladeshi children, some of whom had, uh, had become malnourished and some of whom had not. And uh, you know, look at the relationships with what happened when, uh, with different types of feeding supplements and so forth. Well, that's very exciting, and it, it's clear that the next generation of scientists is going to have a lot of very 
interesting and important work that they can take to carry on from here. Oh, absolutely. One of the most exciting things about projects like the EMP is encouraging everyone to use the framework to answer their own research questions, to formulate um, to formulate their own hypotheses, and then to test them using open methods that, uh, that, that are publicly available, uh, open source software. So, for example, with Chime, the pipeline we develop, uh, the, the version of Chime that you can get from SourceForge is exactly the same as the version we use in the lab. We just check everything in and, uh, and, and make it available immediately. So basically what we want to set up is something that's the equivalent of Flickr for microbes, right? Where, uh, you know, instead of taking a photo of your site, maybe you'll, uh, you know, maybe you'll sample it. Uh, you'll upload that in the cloud. You'll be, able to, uh, you'll, you'll be able to combine it with everything that everyone else has seen in the microbial world and uh, understand these global patterns. An exciting time. Thank you so much for talking to us, Ron. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure.